I'm Darius Rajali. I am a professor of political science at Reed College. Um, this is actually my 30th year at this institution. Um, I survived. <laughs> um, and um, I'm about to go on two years of leave, so this is a lot of fun, too. Um, one of the fun things I get to do is I get to invite people to come and participate in my courses and speak to general audiences. Um, the last time I taught, I teach this course called Torture Prevention, which I think I'm probably the only person in the world who actually teaches a course something like this. And the last time I did this, um, I invited a group of practitioners, people who actually go out there and try and change things and not just theorize about them. Although I think there's a huge role to play um, for theorists and to have a conversation between practitioners and, and social scientists. Um, so as part of that course, um, I've been inviting people, now that I've taught it a second time, uh, I've been inviting people again. Um, Mark is actually kind of an alumni of the first course from four years ago. Um, and when he came with um, Steve Kleinman and Josh Phillips and Chris Meisner, um, who were all um, um, part of a, a big research group in the US government at the time. Um, but let me introduce our speakers today um, and tell you a bit about um, our agenda. Um, our speakers today, Yuval Ginbar and Mark Fallon, um, both are accomplished practitioners, um, but in very different parts of the worlds of torture prevention. Um, and um, they have many common experiences, but also different ones. And what we thought would be most interesting to an audience today would be to talk about the successes and failures. Um, and the two cases that we decided to talk about, Israel and the United States, um, seem to be fairly important ones and therefore important ones to talk about the successes and failures um, about those things. So let me briefly introduce our guest. Um, I am, uh, I've been told that I'm going to participate in the Q&A whether I want to or not because there's sometimes information that I may possess um, that my colleagues may not. Um, so. Um, I'm happy to um, share what little I know about these topics. Um, so let me begin. Uh, uh, Dr. Yuval Ginbar is a legal advisor in the International Secretariat of Amnesty International. Um, I think the main reason um, I thought of him was because Amnesty in 2016 issued a new Manual for Action for Combating Torture and Other Forms of Ill Treatment, and he was the legal advisor on the issuing of that 300-page source book. Um, so he is um, very much in the practitioner side of things, but as an academic, he also has written a number of books. One is Why Not Torture the Torture Terrorists, Moral and Practical and Legal Aspects of the Ticking Time Bomb Justification. Um, he, be, he has written quite a few academic articles, um, and he began um, his work, as he was telling me over lunch yesterday, um, as, a, as a translator um, during the first intifada, um, and he worked in what eventually became Bet Salem, um, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights, and, um, and then eventually for the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel. And more recently, he's worked on human rights mechanisms in ASEAN and Southeast Asia, and um, he has um, been working quite a bit on the war on terror, and he had a very prominent role to play in the Stop Torture campaign of 2014-2015. So um, that's Dr. Ginbar. And maybe I think I'll just stop there, and then I'll introduce Master Fallon after is Mark he going first? going first? You didn't tell me that. <laughs> he did that. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> um, 
<coughs> As you can see, um, people who work in this area have a, a, a light sense of humor. Um, <laughs> uh, so Mark Fallon uh, is uh, an author. Um, he has a long and distinguished career as a security consultant and national security professional. Um, he worked in government service for a long time. He served as the NCIS um, Deputy Assistant Director for Counterterrorism and the Homeland Security Senior Executive. Um, he, his uh, counterterrorism experiences, including investigations of the Sheikh Omar, of Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, the blind Sheikh, he was also responsible for the investigations after the USS Cole um, uh, was attacked in Yemen, and he was the deputy command for, uh, commander of the task force investigating Al Qaeda um, terrorist network for trials before the military commissions. Um, his book, uh, Unjustifiable Means: The Inside Story of How the CIA, Pentagon, and U.S. Government Conspired to torture. If you pick it up, you'll notice that quite a few sections of it are blanked out because he still can't get um, approval to actually have the whole story told and why he feels it's important that the world know the whole story. Uh, so some things he may say, some things he may not. Um, Mark uh, and I and quite a few other people are now working on um, something that's going to be unfolding uh, very shortly, probably within a year or two, there will be a new uh, UN global standard on interrogation, um, which brings together amazingly practically everybody in the anti-torture movements, regardless of our positions around a single flag. Um, it's probably the largest coalition of people I've ever seen come around um, a single issue in this area in my lifetime, short of the Janet Reno eyewitness testimony uh, work that was done. And it's going to be celebrated in part through the launch of a very big book. I, I can't even imagine how fat that book is going to look. Um, uh, called Interrogation and Torture, Integrating Efficacy with Law and Morality, which will be published by Oxford University Press in 2019. And with no more to say, I will give it to Mark. Please welcome Mark Fowler. Yeah, thank you, uh, Darius, and thank you everyone for coming uh, here today. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, the things that I'm going to say today uh, represent my views and do not necessarily represent the views of the United States government or any agency that I work for within the government. Um, so let me, let me kind of start and try to bring you back to how the U.S. got involved in state-sponsored torture um, and my role in it and my experience um, uh, in that. As Darius had, uh, had mentioned, uh, I was the commander of the USS Cole Task Force for NCIS investigating the attack of the uh, USS Cole in Aden, Yemen Harbor uh, on October, uh, October 12, 2000. Um, at the time, I was the chief of counterintelligence operations for NCIS for the Europe, Middle East, and Africa Division. And the primary responsibility of that was threat warnings to the fleet, to the Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, I worked in the Anti-Terrorist Alert, Alert Center for the Navy, uh, and our responsibility was to uh, look at all source fusion intelligence and disseminate that uh, to the fleet to try to prevent what actually happened in Aden, Yemen when we lost 17 sailors uh, on that day uh, in October, about 11.14 uh, in the afternoon uh, in Aden Harbor. Um, but, but let me take you to a little fast forward from that. Uh, because in that investigation and during the question and answers, I'll be happy to go into what details that I, uh, I may be able to uh, regarding that or the 9-11 investigations or whatever uh, else like that. Um, but we had learned quite a bit about al-Qaeda uh, methodologies, uh, attack strategies, uh, recruiting efforts, um, how they operated from the investigation of the USS Cole. Um, we had uh, 
NCIS and FBI agents on the ground in Yemen uh, immediately uh, working jointly the criminal investigation of the attack on the coal, uh, doing uh, uh, rapport building interviews, um, interrogations, uh, uh, if you might call them that, uh, of uh, suspects. Uh, and in Yemen, uh, witnesses become uh, apprehended as well. So they do the, the round up all the usual suspects uh, routine there. Uh, but we had, we learned unprecedented intelligence about Al-Qaeda methodologies and operations through that criminal investigation. And again, uh, through that investigation, NCIS, while anybody watch the television show? Trying to figure if I'm like Mark Harmon or LL Cool J? This is the best it's gonna get for you tonight, I'm sorry. This is, this is it, this is a real NCIS agent, or at least a real former NCIS agent. Um, but, but, you know, we, we, we would then take that investigative product and disseminate that out as intelligence as well. So when you elicit information somebody, um, you can use it as it might be evidence, but it might be intelligence as well. Uh, the act of obtaining that information is the same. Uh, the derivative product is what might be intelligence uh, or evidence. So we had learned so much that the Department of Defense uh, Director of Counterintelligence uh, had asked me to go to Brussels, Belgium uh, to speak at the NATO Defense Ministers Conference uh, to try to explain to the NATO Defense Ministers um, how Al Qaeda operates, how easy it might be to set up a terrorist cell in a foreign port, looking at the coal as an example. We knew where their safe houses were we knew their attack strategies, we knew their recruiting strategies. So the goal was to try, it was a prevention uh, effort. And so on September 10th, uh, 2000, um, I left Dulles Airport, I'm sorry, 2001, on United Airlines flight number two. I sat in seat 38K and I arrived at London at about 7.30 in the morning on September 11th. Uh, I got to my hotel room uh, and I turned on the television uh, after visiting briefly at the NCS office, and I saw unfolding on the television uh, what I knew immediately was an Al-Qaeda uh, attack on the United States. Um, and while we were looking at uh, the threat to our forces overseas, uh, Al-Qaeda struck us in the rear uh, and had a devastating attack, which we lost uh, just about 3,000 people. Uh, it's There's some irony, I think, involved in the fact that uh, just hours before I left Dulles Airport, 9-11 uh, hijackers uh, also went through possibly the same metal detector and security screening uh, that I had uh, just uh, a half a day uh, before that. Uh, and on American Airlines Flight 77, uh, Hani Hanjour and four muscle hijackers uh, crashed a plane into the Pentagon, killing 184 people. And on American Airlines Flight 11 out of Logan, uh, Mohammed Atta, who was the, the, the ground ringleader, uh, the cell leader uh, of the 9-11, or as they referred to it as the planes operation, uh, the coal was referred to as the boats operation. Uh, so this was part of a long range attack strategy uh, against Western targets, uh, against what they considered the fabric uh, of our country, uh, attacking our, uh, our economic strength uh, the World Trade Center, our military strength, the Pentagon, and uh, the other plane, uh, United uh, Flight 93, uh, left Newark Airport uh, for San Francisco with Zaid Jar and three muscle hijackers. And that plane didn't make it to its intended target, uh, which likely would have been the Capitol, the Capitol building. So they hit us uh, and economically with the World Trade Center they hit us militarily with the Pentagon, and they were looking to hit us politically uh, by crashing a plane uh, into the Capitol. That was the only aircraft uh, that day that only had uh, three muscle hijackers on it. There were 19 hijackers uh, in all uh, on that day on September 11th, and one plane was shy, uh, one hijacker. <coughs> and and that, that attack uh, changed our country. Uh, on that day, uh, America changed. Uh, it changed us all, whether we recognize it or not. It certainly, it certainly changed me. 
Um, and, and based on uh, that attack um, and the sheer magnitude of that, um, and, and there were there were indications and warnings of an attack, uh, and that attack uh, was was preventable, uh, just as the coal attack uh, may have been preventable. We had intelligence about small possible small boat threats uh, attacking ships coming through through the Mediterranean. Uh, and prior to September 11th, uh, President Bush was warned uh, about a potential uh, Al Qaeda attack in the United States. Uh, and our national security czar, our counterterrorism czar, Richard Clark, uh, tried to uh, convince Condoleezza Rice of the gravity of Al Qaeda threat to the United States. But at the time, our political leaders uh, in a new administration, the Bush administration, uh, just was unwilling, unwilling to listen to these warnings. Uh, because as, as George Tenet said, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, through that summer, uh, the system was blinking red. We knew something was gonna happen. It was inevitable. Uh, we, we had the intel that thing, something was gonna happen. We didn't know where, we didn't know when, uh, but we knew that there would be an attack somewhere uh, against Western targets, uh, likely the US, uh, and our political leaders failed to hear, heed those warnings. And I think that that, that, that condition, uh, possibly some, some guilt involved in that, uh, but decisions were made uh, by the United States government and President Bush uh, based on three things. Uh, fear, fear of a potential other attacks, maybe fear of blame for what they ignored before, uh, but fear was a component to the subsequent decisions they made. Uh, ignorance. Uh, decisions were made out of ignorance, and I'll get to those uh, momentarily. And, and the third factor involved in the decision-making process uh, was arrogance. And I'll talk a little bit about our arrogance post 9-11 in the decision-making process that drove us to state-sponsored torture, that drove the United States a country built upon the premise of the rule of law and human rights would then resort to practices that are against at least what I considered American values. Um, so, so subsequent to that September 11th attack, uh, while the embers were still burning in the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, on September 17th, uh, 2001, uh, President Bush made the decision to give the CIA the authority uh, to take the lead in collecting intelligence uh, from terrorist suspects. And he issued what's called a memorandum of notification. And most of your TV shows, if you watch about the CIA, they're called findings. Uh, but, but that is a, a covert authorization to the Central Intelligence Agency, um, which uh, to do certain actions at the direction of the president. Um, and, and that enabled the CIA to create what was known as the RDI program, Rendition, Detention, and Interrogation Program. None of those things were core competencies of the Central Intelligence Agency. I know on television, CIA officers, they're, they're not agents, they're officers, do quite a bit uh, of things like that. But, but uh, prior to this, there was very little uh, core capabilities within the Central Intelligence Agency to actually do uh, an investigative interview. And so they, when the CIA got this mission, rather than turning to career professionals, rather than turning to the FBI, who was the agency responsible within the United States government for the investigation of terrorism, uh, they turned to two psychologists, and I'll be happy to talk about them later. Their names are Mitchell and Jessen who had no experience with Al-Qaeda, had no experience with interrogations, legitimate interrogations, and they helped devise a program called the EIT program. Uh, the CIA called it uh, the Enhanced Interrogation uh, uh, Technique Program, but there was none, nothing enhanced about it. Uh, I refer to the EIT program as the excuses to inflict torture, uh, and, that, and, that's what, and that's what we did as a government. And, and little did I know at the time, because I was sent uh, from London, where I was, stuck for a few days, uh, 
directly to CENTCOM in Tampa, Florida, which was the war headquarters to help uh, develop the, uh, uh, the counterintelligence annex to the invasion plan for Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, the invasion of Afghanistan, which was inevitable. Uh, and then I headed back uh, to Washington, D.C., back to NCIS headquarters to take over my responsibilities as a chief of counterintelligence operations for the invasion going into Afghanistan. Um, and something, uh, uh, again, that, that stood out to me as remarkable occurred, uh, and that was on the 12th of November, 2001, uh, President Bush issued a military order, an executive order from the president. And what the president said was a few things. He said that the Article III courts, the federal court system, Article III meaning Article III of our Constitution, the constitutional courts of the United States are not practicable to try terrorists, uh, to bring terrorists to justice. And, and that statement on the surface is just basically untrue. Our federal court system had been very effective at bringing terrorists to justice. I was involved in a case on the Blind Shake where we brought terrorists to justice in federal district court in the Southern District of New York in Manhattan. And, and so we actually had uh, a justice system that was capable uh, of doing so. Um, and the president said that what we need to do is take these uh, enemy combatants and bring them to justice before a new process called military commissions. And the president said uh, only he within the government is the deciding person to decide who gets brought before military commissions. And he issued this order that cascaded to Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and that order wound up on my lap. Uh, and that order said that I should investigate anyone who is or was a member of Al-Qaeda, anyone who aided, abetted, or knowingly harbored the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. Uh, and my primary responsibility was to provide President Bush which what we called reason to believe determinations, uh, that there was reason to believe uh, that the person I was investigating fell under the provisions of the military order of the President of the United States, uh, and, and I did so. And I was the deputy commander and special agent in charge of a, uh, a task force, a special task force, uh, reporting to the Office of, Spe of Secretary of Defense to investigate that Al-Qaeda terrorist network for trials before military commission uh, that are still in some semblance of a judicial process ongoing at Guantanamo Bay. And again, I'll, I'll be happy to field questions on that. Uh, but I want to get a little further, uh, further along here uh, because there has been some information uh, that has been declassified uh, since then. And I just want to, I think I have it here somewhere. I want to read to you um, a quote from a document that was declassified uh, in 2016. If anyone's reporting back to the CIA, I have the declassification date here. Um, and this document is actually on the CIA website, uh, which, is where, which is where I obtained it. And this was a document. And what the CIA did is to try to avoid looking like documents were official they would call them draft documents. Uh, but the ACLU and other organizations under our FOIA, our Freedom of Information Laws, was able to obtain these documents. Uh, but this is a document uh, internal to the CIA, formally top secret, uh, dated 26 November uh, 2001. And the CIA uh, cites the federal law that makes it a crime for a US citizen to torture someone, both home and abroad, and it lists the international law, it lists case law, and then it has a lot of blanks. I don't know why I got black in my book and they got white on this document, but what, I'll call your attention to one paragraph and I'll read it for you because this was the 26th of November, 2001. A policy decision must be made with regard to the U.S. use of torture in light of our obligations under international law with consideration given to the circumstances and to international opinion on our current campaign against terrorism. States, meaning other countries, 
may be very unwilling to call the U.S. to task for torture when it resulted in saving thousands of lives. And so what the CIA was banking on was that these practices, these dehumanizing practices that they had planned on uh, administering uh, to these terrorist suspects that they were rendering, kidnapping from around the world and putting into what became known as black sites, uh, that one of the, there were a few things that had to happen. Uh, one was uh, they had to have legal cover. And so uh, there were the, the uh, torture memos written uh, by John Yu and others to try to give legal cover to torture. Um, and then they needed medical cover. So they used psychologists to try to say that there's no lasting effect to what we plan to do. And so they gave medical cover uh, to torture. Um, and I don't want to call it in defense of President Bush by any means. But when he made those decisions, he made them thinking no one would ever know about what we did. It's a black program. It would be a deniable program. So when he made these decisions, the thought was that the American public would never learn what we did and that those people that they picked up would never be able to tell anybody about what we did to them. And so, so that was the creation of our RDI program that from the, from the beginning, and that's, and that's why we decided as a government to try to use military commissions rather than the federal district court because the thought was they would better be able to protect that classified information to protect the integrity of a black program by using, uh, utilizing a military commission process rather than a federal district court process, an Article III court process uh, on these terrorist suspects. And, and, I, and I mentioned um, that we had uh, one missing hijacker on that flight that crashed in Sanctuary, Pennsylvania. And, and that person's name is Mohammed al -Qatani. And Mohammed al Qatani was detainee number 63 at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and in the summer of 2002, uh, when we learned uh, that Qatani tried to enter the country in Orlando, Florida, uh, just a few months before, in August 2001, before the September 11th attacks, and a calling card registered to Mohammed Atta uh, was outside waiting for him. He was turned away. Uh, and sent back to, to Saudi Arabia. But when we had Katani at Guantanamo, it was when the Department of Defense decided that they were gonna adopt the same exact torture practices that the CIA was utilizing on the prisoners and their black sites. Uh, and it was at that time uh, when I saw that those torture techniques were migrating, were, that cancer was metastasizing within the Department of Defense. Um, and, and I don't wanna say that I expected this out of the CIA, uh, but institutionally, and I had worked with the CIA for years. Um, institutionally, they have had a history of being involved with abusive practices. The MK Ultra program in the 50s and 60s where they did research um, and, and they had uh, uh, the the uh, Kubark counterintelligence manual, which utilized coercion and torture, and it morphed into a program called the HRE program, Human Resource Exploitation Program, in South America, Project X in Vietnam. So historically, the CIA had reverted to these practices in the past, um, but those practices were based on uh, the manner in which the North Koreans had abused our prisoners and had elicited false information, information they used for propaganda purposes. And what the CIA did not do, what they said, re-engineer re them. What they did do was adopt them. They adopt them, adopted them technique by technique, uh, procedure by procedure. And when a CIA lawyer came to the uh, Guantanamo Bay on October 2nd, uh, just a week or so after a plane load of the most powerful lawyers in the United States government came there, Alberto Gonzalez, President Bush's lawyer, 
David Addington, uh, Dick Cheney's lawyer, Jim Haynes, who I reported to, uh, who was Donald Rumsfeld's lawyer, um, John Rizzo, George Tenet's lawyer, director of the CIA, Michael Chertoff, John Ascroft's lawyer, the Attorney General. On September 25th, 2002, they flew to Guantanamo, and I tried to head them off. I flew down there to try to convince them not to go down this path, and they refused to see me. They refused to hear my, what my experience told me, uh, what my instincts told me, uh, what I believed was a practice that was illegal, immoral, and not just ineffective, uh, but counterproductive. Um, and, and they didn't listen, and we adopted within the Department of Defense standard operating procedures that incorporated torture tactics within our policies. Um, and, that, and that information, uh, as I said, isn't just ineffective, uh, it, it's counterproductive. And what happened is, I mentioned these reason to believe determinations uh, that I was doing for the president. Um, just about the time, uh, late summer when we identified Katani, uh, there was another prisoner in Bagram named Ibn Sheikh Alibi. Ibn Sheikh Alibi was the emir of the boss, the head of the Kaldan training camp in Afghanistan. And I thought Ibn Sheikh Alibi would be an excellent candidate to bring to justice for military commission process. Uh, and I was preparing a reason to believe for Ibn Sheikh Alibi. And Ibn Sheikh Alibi was ghosted. He was gone from Afghanistan, uh, later to learn that he was sent into Egypt. He was rendered to Egypt and he was tortured by the Egyptian security services. Uh, and Ibn Sheikh Alibi uh, provided some information uh, and that information on October 7th, uh, just after the CIA visit and these lawyers visited Guantanamo Bay, President Bush on October 7th went to Cincinnati, Ohio and to try to rally the American public that there was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which there was not at the time. Uh, he said that there was rock solid information there was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And that was on October 2nd, 7th, uh, 2002. Uh, and later on, on February 5th, 2003, Colin Powell went before the United Nations and said the same thing, there was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, to rally international support for the invasion uh, of Iraq. And to me, someone who'd worked Al-Qaeda for years, uh, that made absolutely no sense. Uh, and to show you how horrible and brutal those techniques were. On October 2nd, the CIA lawyer uh, stated a number of things. But one of the things he stated that when he set the parameters, the legal parameters for this program was, if a detainee dies, you're doing it wrong. If a detainee dies, you're doing it wrong. So that's the threshold for this program. And in November of that year, less than a month later, Ghoul Rockman died in a dark, dank CIA torture chamber, naked from the waist down, chained to a wall, after going through this program administered uh, by the CIA. And so, Ibn Sheikh al uh, never I never got uh, to, to ask him his story. When he finally got out of Egyptian custody, he was debriefed by some US representatives, and he said, I just made that up so the pain would stop. I told my interrogators what they wanted to hear. And so policy decisions are made based on false and fabricated information. So when people say, does torture work? Absolutely it works. It works to get false information. It, it works to get policy decisions. And so from those decisions, we went to war. We went to war with Iraq. And you know when we went to war with Iraq? You know when that invasion started? 16 years ago today. Today is the 16 year anniversary of the invasion of Iraq based on false and fabricated information produced from a torture program. So with that, let me yield the floor and I look forward to your questions later.
You'll introduce him again. I'm going to introduce him again. <laughs> well, this time it'll be shorter. Uh, Yuval Ginbar, I will <laughs> introduce, is, I'll just briefly say he's the, um, an important legal advisor at Amnesty International, and um, he, he learned um, all of, he knows about sort of human rights work just working in the field, um, first with Bet Salem and a group of Israeli human rights um, organizations, and has since moved to London. So please welcome Yuval Gimbar. You sure you don't want to introduce me a third time? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, so good evening. Uh, let's see if this. Yeah. Um, I'll talk mostly about Israel's legalized torture system, but I will eventually say something about prevention and focus on a specific prevention <clears throat> strategy which stands out in that it's extremely unhelpful and inefficient. Um, so I'll be discussing interrogational torture, focusing again on terrorist suspects, but it's important to remember, even as we do this tonight, that in our world, most torture victims are not terrorists. Rather, the poor, disempowered, marginalized people who get beaten up as quick punishment, as means of getting a confession, or a bribe, or simply to show who's boss. Just, just a thought. Uh, so the question is, what is the best way for a modern democratic state to enable its interrogators to torture terrorist suspects whenever this is considered necessary without incurring major damage? How, how do you create a durable, stable, smoothly operating torture system that could withstand any challenges and the, taste of the, the test of time. One thing you certainly don't do is to emulate the USA and what it did after 9-11, as we just heard. Uh, the system was established very quickly in a panic. Um, it operated during <clears throat> two hastily organized war. It was on a pretty massive scale. It was out of control. There was a failed attempt to keep uh, everything secret, again, as Mark just described, and there was no serious attempt to garner support from the public, let alone Congress or the courts. Uh, and the torture system sort of lasted until 2007, and then, by and large, it collapsed, although there have been lef leftovers, of course. Um, so first advice, if you want to pr to, uh, a properly functioning torture system, don't panic. Secondly, keep your scope or scale restricted. Third, it needs to be tightly controlled. Fourth, be prepared for at least partial public exposure. Finally, make your public opinion, your parliament, and very importantly, your judges, make sure they're on your side. So for those of you students who want to see their future careers as interrogators in a no holds barred anti-terrorism unit, I recommend that instead of looking at the USA, you look at the torture system in Israel, where, where torture has been systematic and legalized since more or less 1987. Uh, many, many thousands of Palestinians, as well as a handful of Jews, must be admitted, have been tortured, and the system is going strong. Um, I'm not going to go back to 1987, but I'll, I'll focus on the current legalized torture system, which is about 20 years old. It'll be 20 years old in September. It was created through a 1999 Supreme Court ruling. The ruling was in response to several petitions, most of them from the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel, Pakati for short, and for fair disclosure, personally I was involved in this case with, with Pakati. Uh, the ruling annulled a previous system which allowed pre-authorized uh, torture methods, euphemistically called moderate physical pressure, in the interrogation of Palestinian terrorist suspects. There are essentially two parts to the ruling. <clears throat> in one, the court discussed a reasonable interrogation. It said unequivocally that a reasonable 
reasonable interrogation must be free from torture or other ill treatment, not least because they are absolutely prohibited under international law. Therefore, nobody can authorize an agent of the Internal Security Service, or it's called, I, I'll call it ISA for short, uh, to use any of the method, methods they had largely, they had been legally authorized to use, uh, and indeed routinely used since uh, 1987. So far, so good. But then the court started talking about that, oh, no. sorry, this is just a map, <laughs> okay. Then the court started, I, I, I tried this dramatic thing and didn't work. Let me try again. Then the court started talking about the ticking bomb. So for those of you who are not familiar, it's a more or less philosophical scenario. What if you caught a terrorist who had just planted a bomb that would blow up the whole campus of Reed College, uh, killing thousands, hundreds, thousands, whatever, and there's no time to evacuate, and the only way of making him tell you, make the, making the terrorist tell you where the bomb is, is by torturing him. So in Israel, this scenario is part of the law. Um, when, when the court discussed what it's called, the ticking time bomb, uh, there's no longer mention of international law, no longer mention of reasonable interrogations, uh, of torture for that matter, or of absolute prohibitions. Instead, the court, the court invokes the defense of necessity. Now, this is a provision in the laws of most countries. Uh, for instance, if you break into a house, but the house is on fire and you're breaking into the house to save people, so you, you're, you're committing an offense, you're breaking and entering. But, of course, you're doing it for, for for a good purpose, so the court, if it ever reaches the court, which is unlikely, w would acquit you on the, on the basis of the defense of necessity. So what's the connection? If an ISA interrogator finds himself in a ticking bomb situation and applies what the court referred to, again, euphemistically, as physical interrogation methods, then even if he's not authorized to do so, and is obviously breaking Israeli law, the court ruled that after the fact, the Attorney General could decide that this agent is covered by the defense of necessity since, again, he broke the law for a good cause. So he wouldn't face trial or even be subjected to a criminal investigation. What the court, in effect, did is that with one hand, it ceremoniously closed the door on torture and the routine use of the ISIS uh, torture methods, while on the other hand, it opened a window for ISIS interrogators to continue to resort to torture. I mean, they didn't say torture, they said, of course, physical interrogation methods in these ticking bomb situations. Let's see how it works in practice. It, it should be remembered, though, that about a year after that court uh, this issued its ruling, the second Palestinian Intifada broke out, and with it there was, among many other things, a wave of terrorist attacks, um, mostly uh, by, by suicide bombings, which cost the lives of many hundreds of civilians. So this is not abstract stuff. Uh, the first requirement of a professional torturing system is that the torturers should have the space and time to do their work without interference. So for this reason, under the military legislation prevailing in the occupied territories, Palestinian detainees can be kept without seeing a lawyer, and of course family, for up to 90 days. They are brought before judges without their lawyers, but these are military judges wearing Israeli army uniform, so, so the Palestinians would be forgiven for not feeling that they can communicate freely. Uh, the first friendly face uh, they would see is that of a delegate uh, of the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which sees every de detainee within a maximum of 14 days. And the ICRC of, often complain uh, to the Israeli authorities, but it's within their rules of confidentiality. So it's a confidential complaint and a confidential response. Nobody knows, and that's it. So there's plenty of time for 
ISA uh, interrogators to do whatever they consider necessary uh, in so-called ticking bomb situations. The following methods uh, are used during what's called necessity interrogations uh, as consistently described by Palestinian detainees in affidavits to Pakati and other human rights and, uh, NGOs. These, the, what I'm going to detail has also been acknowledged officially by ISA itself in, in documents presented to defense lawyers and in testimonies by uh, its agents in court hearings. So there's incommunicado detention that I just described. That's an interrogation method, okay? It, it may sound just, well, no lawyers, no family. It's an interrogation method. Sleep deprivation by means of continuous or nearly continuous interrogation. For example, according to ISA interrogation logs, in one case, there was 46 hours with a one, two-hour break after 25 hours. Slapping and blows. There's much more of those in Palestinians' description than in I, that ISA <coughs> acknowledges. However, ISA has admitted to beatings, especially slapping during interrogation. Uh, frog position. Okay. Or oh, couching. I'm, I'm using the uh, um, the the ISA term. So um, I, I there's crouching and there's the half crouch. I think this one is actually more painful, and of course it's not for two seconds. <coughs> Um, so here's a quotation from an affidavit by a Palestinian. Afterwards, they released the shackles and I was ordered to sit in a frog position. To sit on my toes with my knees partly bent for 45 consecutive minutes. And all the while, my hands were shackled behind me. Each time that I would lose strength and fall or lower my foot to the floor, one of the interrogators would lift my body and the second would slap me or beat me on the soles of my feet. Then there's the star attraction, which is the banana position. Um, Isa uses the term tilting of the torso, hatayat gev in Hebrew, which involves, and I'm quoting an Isa agent, the interrogee sitting on a chair with the backrest to his side, and we tilt his sitting position in an angle of 45 degrees, more or less, for a fixed period. From other documents, it appears that this position is enforced for up to 30 minutes each time. Uh, here's a quote from an affidavit by a Palestinian. So this method was to handcuff me from behind with my legs tied backwards under the chair. The interrogator would push me back so that I was sitting on the seat while leaning backwards, and at the same time, they kept me they kept beating me on the stomach. This position was maintained for about 15 minutes. And then the interrogator would forcibly yank me forward. I simply felt terrified and I had excruciating pain in my back and I felt that my back was about to really break and I yelled <coughs> and I cried and I begged but the torture didn't stop. R rather than breaking Palestinian detainees through shock and awe, the ISA interrogators use what the has called torture by stealth. The idea is to pile up pressure and pain gradually through the accumulation of time and methods. So thinking about this, don't ask yourself if you're fit enough to stay in one of these positions for half an hour. Instead, imagine the full picture, how you'd feel um, being totally isolated from the outside world, not or hardly having slept for days, being keep, kept constantly in one room, interrogated endlessly, threatened, cursed, slapped, and being placed time and time again in these positions, and having no idea when it would end. Now these are obviously, again, violations of Israeli law, but nothing happens unless there's a complaint from Pakati, from the ICSC, or from others. There's a DOJ official whose job it is to investigate such complaints. She talks to the detainee, to the ISA interrogators, and 
gathers other information such as medical records. Then there's two possibilities. One, the interrogators deny the factual claims of the complaint, in which case the official recommends and the DOJ closes the file. Two, interrogators do not deny the facts, or not some of the facts. Uh, instead, they say that this was a necessity interrogation in a ticking bomb situation. Uh, so th there's a standard letter Pakati gets on such occasions. Um, then it goes to the Attorney General, and the Attorney General accepts the plea and closes the file. There's a sort of a third uh, um, scenario where usually, again, it's the Public Committee Against Torture, petitions the Supreme Court uh, to, to, to actually open a criminal inter investigation. Um, and the Supreme Court, you know, hears it and talks about it and closes the file. So this is the statistical picture that all of this creates. Um, so there's a lot of zeros and nevers, you know. So the Supreme Court ruled that the defense of necessity would apply, quote, when the act is the result of an improvisation given the unpredictable nature of the event. But, but in practice, it soon became clear that the Attorney General is always going to accept the ticking bomb necessity argument and never going to order criminal investigation and the Supreme Court will back them up. So after possible hesitations initially, ISA agents have been going on about their torture business without worrying for 20 years. Um, now, necessity interrogations are, are a small minority of the thousands of interrogations that Palestinians undergo every year. Uh, their numbers fluctuate in accordance with the situation. So during one year in the period of the, the, first, the, the second intifada, I acknowledged that on 90 occasions they used extraordinary interrogation methods. In other words, they tortured. Uh, now things are much more quiet, so the numbers are in all likelihood much lower. Uh, though, of course, even non-necessity interrogators Interrogations often involve prolonged incommunicado detention, long interrogations, pretty awful conditions of detention de designed to, to break detainee's spirit. And these, depending on circumstances, could also legally constitute uh, torture. And even if they don't, they constitute, to use the legal term, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, which is also prohibited absolutely in all circumstances under international law. And, and of course, in the Middle East, things can deteriorate very quickly any time. Uh, I'm going to be a bit controversial now and, and uh, say something about effectiveness. Uh, I think the two extreme proposals that torture always works and the torture never works should be discarded. I, I, I also think that we, we now have tons of evidence, including expert evidence, as provided partially today, that humane questioning can be extremely effective in, in obtaining reliable intelligence, and that torture is often ineffective and used and, and, and leads to false information. But I, I'm, I'm convinced, based on, on, on fairly thorough knowledge, that that in specific situations, ISA torture did reveal information about plots to launch terrorist attacks that which would have killed many. And uh, unfortunately, our, our world is not one where you do good, you get good, you do bad, you get bad. Um, so w one, one argument is, it, it, about the effectiveness of torture is that people would, would just tell you imaginary stuff and send interrogators in, uh, in completely wrong directions. But this doesn't happen that much with professional torturers such as the ISA interrogators. 
Uh, in the West Bank, for instance, if an, if the ISA, if an ISA interrogator is asking you, um, who are the other members of your terrorist cell? And you say, I don't know, Abdel Fattah Sisi, okay? It would take the interrogator about five seconds to figure out there's no such person, well, not in the uh, West Bank anyway. That's because they have the name of each and every person in the West Bank on their database. If what you say seems reliable, they can check it out, okay? They don't, they don't have to fly around halfway around the world. It's, it's in the, the whole thing is in Israel's backyard. Um, and if they realize that you're, you're telling them false information, they go back to torturing you until you, you notice that either you give them what, what they want, which is reliable information, or you, or you continue to get tortured. So um, some, of course, do withstand any torture, but some don't. Um, and as we saw, the ISA interrogations will, will use torture by stealth or gradual learned helplessness, so you, you're not too traumatized to think straight. Let's put it this way. For me, more convincing, um, on top of, 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 of the usual practical things, that it often doesn't work, and other things do work just as well, if not better, is, is on the practical level, is that even if it, torture wins battles, it will lose wars. I mean, Israel's tortured for, for 60 years, and, and it hasn't brought security. In fact, Israel, as you may know, brought, uh, built its own wall, illegal wall, in the West Bank to stop the terrorists from coming. So uh, if torture was that effective, they wouldn't have needed that wall. Um, So we must combine arguments on the practical level with a principled absolutist reject, rejection of torture irrespective of whether it's effective or not. So finally, here's my pitch for the airy fairy prevention strategy, which is convincing people that torture is always, but always wrong. Uh, I've written my own book about it, so I'm now going to read the first 97 pages, <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay, but it's, it's very condensed, so it may be not be very convincing. Um, uh, people and scholars, uh, many of them who support the torture system in Israel, say it's fanatic to contend that we mustn't ever torture, not even to save hundreds of innocent lives. But ultimately, ultimately it's a question of what kind of human beings we want to be, what kind of society we want to live in. You see, torture is the ultimate atrocity. There's nothing one human being can do to another that's so terrible that it goes beyond, it transcends torture. So arguing never say never to torture means actually believing that there is no single act, however terrible, that we must absolutely rule out. So this is how an honest anti-rape hashtag would look like under this view. Um, to, that's an honest one, because you, you can't say no. You can't say never rape. You can't say, if, if, you, if you believe in the ticking time bomb exception to torture, this is basically the same philosophy. Uh, actually, rape and other sexual violence are often used as a form of torture, including during interrogation. You see, I'm going to be a bit harsh here, so, so please cover your ears if, if you're not up to it. Uh, I'm serious. Um, being very practical, rape is better as an interrogation method than many physical means, uh, you know, painful physical means. It needn't be painful physically at all. And it may not need to get that far. Some would break and give you the information you seek at the first mention of rape. Others, when you take off this or that part of their clothing. Others, when you place them naked in a certain position. Now, this is 
disgusting thinking and it makes my skin crawl even if I, I, I have used it before. But, but I'm trying to make you face what exactly it is you're proposing if you say that torture sometimes is justified. And the question is, do you want to live in a society where it is legitimate for your officials to make considerations such as, do we rape or not? How do we maximize or rather optimize the pain? She's crying and begging us to stop. Should we pause or just add a little bit more now and pause later? A question you should ask yourself is, do you really want your government officials to have this kind of power over people, however horrible they are? Or do you want really to have this kind of officials in your government? And then there's, there's a notion of, oh, but it's just a special case, just extreme circumstances, but that works in many directions, and, and, and I'll, I'll end with a quotation going back to the war on terror, a quotation from uh, Khaled Sheikh Muhammad, the self-confessed or self-professed uh, architect of 9-11. Uh, this is what he said to the Combatant Status Review Tribunal in Guantanamo in 2007. Uh, he spoke in broken English, but I think his words are, are, are very uh, um, important. He said, I don't like to kill people. I feel very sorry they have been killed kids in 9-11. I know American people are torturing us from 70s. Now there's a redacted bit. I know they're talking about human rights. And I know it is against, like torture, is against American constitution, against American laws. But they say every law, they have exception. This is your bad luck, you being part of the exception to our laws. He's right. Those who justify torture in the name of fighting terrorism actually think very much like the terrorists them th themselves. You can't logically say that your goal justifies torture, but someone else's goal doesn't justify bringing towers down. Thank you.